in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Destin Melbarnes, Lizzie Haynes, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights to the Retro Movie Roundtable. Welcome to the show where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Russell Guest, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host from the Derby City in Louisville, Ms. Lizzie Haynes. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so excited about tonight's guest. It's going to be really, really fun. Why don't you introduce tonight's guest for us then, Lizzie? Y'all, it's my dad. I have my dad on the podcast, Michael Wilder. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, Russell. I'm happy to be here. Hello, Michael. Yay. It's so exciting. I'm excited too. The man who made me fall in love with movies. Full circle moment. Well, on that note, as we break the ice and get ready to go into things here, what is a movie that your family holds dear, which means you kind of enjoy rewatching it together and it's just kind of a family staple for you guys? Michael? I wish I could say it was something really profound, but if you go on the basis of the movie that is most often referred to and quoted by the family, it might be Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> Oh, that's a good answer. <laughs> that's a movie that our whole family loves. And I really think Lizzie and our son Ellis can almost recite the dialogue from the movie. It's really. <laughs> well, one, two, five. Lizzie. Yes. What would your family staple that you really enjoy watching be? You know, it would have to be my dealer's choice that I did last year with Robin Williams, Toys. That was a huge movie for us growing up. It must just be the Christmas scene in the beginning and at the end. But for us, it became a Christmas movie. That movie warms my heart every single time I watch it. I honestly can't watch it without getting choked up because there's so much nostalgia. All right. And hey, I'm in favor of that because if you have a movie that is special to you guys at Christmas time, it can be a Christmas movie. Those debates That's of right. is it a Christmas movie or not, I say it has to do with your family. So That's right. <laughs> One of ours is at Christmas time, The Muppet Christmas Carol. We've been watching pretty much every year since it came out at Christmas time. We did we covered that one on an episode once upon a time, and that is near and dear to my heart from the time I've been a child. And then if not at Christmas time, what about Bob? Is another one of those ones that just we all have a very good time watching. So we've covered both of these. So what is the last movie you saw, Michael? Heaven knows Mr. Allison. It's a uh, John Houston movie, a Robert Mitchum and Deborah Kerr. Deborah Kerr is a, a nun alone on an island, and it just so happens that Robert Mitchum is a marooned Marine in World War II who happens to land on the island. And of course, not too long after that, the Japanese show up. It's a, a wonderful movie. Anything that John Huston has written is worth watching. And when he has written and directed one, like uh, Heaven Knows Mr. Allison, definitely worth watching. Ooh, that's a good recommendation. We just nice. got done covering Treasure of the Sierra Madre, which was a Houston movie as well. And uh, we've covered Maltese Falcon from him and before. So I'm with you. I'm really enjoying everything from Houston I've actually seen. So I'll have to check that one out someday. Lizzie, how about you? What's the last movie you saw? So this is a true story. When I was in high school, I, again, my dad is the person that helped me to fall in love with movies. And I really wanted to go see Mean Girls when it came out. And my dad took me to theaters to go see Mean Girls, which is like dad of the year award to sit through that with me. And last week, Aaron and I went to go see the remake of it, the musical. And I, you know, of course, going, I'm thinking just like, how sweet is it that my dad took me to see the first one and then my husband takes me to see the second one. It could not hold a candle to the first, but it was cute. Does the music good? Music was great. Music was great. Little fun fact is that the girl who plays Janice Ian is the voice of Moana, and she did it fantastic. Oh, that's a fun thing. I didn't know that. Yes. So the last movie that I saw, talking about throwbacks of pre prior eras, my four-year-old son, Grant, really enjoyed Superman with Christopher Reeve a while ago. So we did Superman 2, 1980, with General Zod in it, and he really had a, he had a blast. He watched it and instantly wanted to watch it again. It was too late. We had to get up the next day, and he still had that energy to want to watch it again. So I watched Superman 2 twice. 
Yeah, I, I don't want to make you feel old, but I saw the other day on Turner Classic Movies that they were listing Superman as a movie that had been restored. I may have misread it, but I, the, the thought that a movie that is that new could be restored, it really makes me feel old, especially when I'm watching some of these movies from the 30s and 40s. On that note, Lizzie, what are we going to cover today? We are going to cover The Third Man. This movie stars Joseph Cotton, Alita Valley, Orson Welles, and Trevor Howard. It comes out in 1949. Its budget, I don't have clear data on at this point, but it grosses 277,000 pounds from the UK domestically. The number one movie in 1949 was Samson and Delilah. IMDb gives The Third Man an 8.1, which is pretty strong. The critics of Rotten Tomatoes love this movie. It's 99%, so that's even stronger. Audience score is not far behind at 93%. This is an Academy Award winner for Best Cinematography, Black and White, uh, which I completely understand. It is nominated for Best Director for Carol Reed and Best Film Editing. It did not win those twos, but it did win the Palme d'Or. I mean, that's the big prize in Cannes. So that is the Golden Palm or the highest award for best film over there. So they got that. It was nominated for a Director's Guild Award. Not as lauded necessarily at the time, but AFI really likes this movie. The AFI said this is the number 57 movie of all time. They said that it is the number 75 most thrilling movie of all time. And in the top 100 heroes and villains, they named Harry Lime. 39, which he's a pretty pretty bad guy, as we'll talk about here later. And this is the number five mystery movie of all time, they said. And the BFI claims this as well. It's got an American producer, so it's on the American Film Institute's countdown, but it's also on the British one. The BFI said that this is their number one movie ever. Gene Siskel remarked this is an exemplary piece of movie making, highlighting the ruins of World War II and juxtaposing it with all the characters of our own damaged histories. And Roger Ebert cited this as his favorite film and listed it in his piece of 10 greatest films of all time. So he thumbs up even harder than Gene Siskel's thumbs up. They're just two very enthusiastic thumbs up on this one. And in Vienna in 2005, there's a museum that actually opened and is dedicated to this. There's a 400 square meter museum, 16 different rooms displaying comprehensive collection of original exhibits all around the world. Not many movies get a museum dedicated to them. Michael, had you seen this movie? What was your background with it? I have probably seen this movie from start to finish at least five times before I started even thinking about participating with with this podcast. But the first time I saw it, I think I just sort of stumbled on it. And I probably was attracted to it at first by the soundtrack. It has such an unusual soundtrack. It just grabs your attention. And when you delve into it a little deeper, you realize that the entire soundtrack was composed and performed by one person. It's not an orchestra, it's one guy playing uh, an instrument, and it's just absolutely fabulous. To me, the measure of a movie that you really love is if you're flipping through the channels and you happen to catch it and it's a third of the way through it, you will stop and watch the last two thirds of the movie. This is one of those movies that Nowadays, you can get movies on demand, so it's not like it used to be when I was uh, a little younger, when you had to catch a movie when it was being broadcast. But this is one of those movies that if I can catch the last five minutes of it or the first five minutes of it, I will watch it because it just grabs my attention and, and holds it. So you've been with this one for a while. Do you feel like it's been a rewarding rewatch coming back to it? You know... The first time you watch this movie, it's a fantastic mystery, I think. To me, the measure of a good mystery movie or a good movie just generally is now that I, I know everything that happens in it and I still watch it over and over again. Just every time I watch it, I find something new, some new character or some new line that I missed or forgot about from previous uh, times that I've watched it. So I think it holds up very, very well. And... Do you feel like this movie is enduring well through the ages? Because this, this movie is made a long time ago. This is made in the 40s. Do you think it still has a place that you would say, like, people today still need to watch this movie? Well, I think it does. And I think it holds up better than a lot of the early film noir movies. Because I think the plot is so much more sophisticated 
than so many of those movies. Even some of the absolute great movies, uh, Maltese Falcon comes to mind. The plot is really, really simple in that movie. And it's really, really simple in a, a lot of the classic film noirs. In this one, the plot unfolds so slowly and sort of step by step by step. That combined with the scenery, uh, right? scenery is probably not the right word. Setting is probably a better word. Uh, the setting in post-war Vienna, it helps if you know a little bit of history of post-war Vienna and actually the way people in Austria were probably feeling at the time this, this movie was produced and, and came out on the screen. But between the setting, the fantastic story, the unbelievable cinematography, I think it holds up really, really well. That's so well said. Lizzie, had you gotten this one from your dad before, or is this your first time with it? This is my first time. So this wasn't my first time hearing about the movie. I actually, my dad has always loved classic movies, and I've this something that I've known about him. When we first watched, I want to say it was The Killers. That was the first movie that, the first noir film that I watched through this podcast. I immediately told him and was like, hey, you know, I I just watched an old movie and I actually really, really liked it. And the more we talked about noir films, this just naturally came up and he was like, you've got to watch The Third Man. It's my favorite. And then, of course, that kind of came to the genesis of where we are today of me sharing that information with you, Russell, and and then over time, just realizing that it'd be a great fit to record. And so, no, I'd never watched it before. I knew only really just the very sprinklings of what my dad had shared with me because, you know, of course he doesn't want to give away the actual mystery. So I knew that there was going to be a, is there a third man? Is there not? But that was really it. And I loved it. I think it was so well done. And I feel like in just the way that that you said, dad, I feel like it holds up so well because you are on the edge of your seat you're trying to figure out was there a third man and like what what did he do like what is who is this hairy line person and what is he so guilty of and why is everybody behaving the way they're behaving and there's so many questions and you truly are finding out piece by piece just like you said i just i love it it's simple and complex all in one and it's just really fun to watch i had a great time you know an interesting note i looked up lists of top film noir movies And amazingly, this movie does not make some of those lists. And I think one of the reasons is because uh, it's a foreign film. It's made in England. Or, or, well, it was uh, the the director and the the movie was really first released in in England. But if you look at the Rotten Tomatoes, which I think is a good uh, place to look for these kinds of things, they have a list of top film noir movies, and it's number four on their list. So people that actually watch movies. Yeah, <laughs> I think would rate this one very highly, but you might leave it off of a list because it's a foreign film. It's not set in Hollywood, made in Hollywood, cast with a bunch of uh, people from Hollywood. You have Joseph Cotton here, but and of course you have Orson Welles, but most of the other cast are European or British. As for me, I had seen this one before. My father-in-law was a big fan of it, and my sister-in-law started getting into it as well when she first found out about it. So it was a Christmas gift. DVD copy of it to my father-in-law. We watched it that Christmas, and that was my introduction to the movie. I had no expectations because it was all happening very fast. I saw a present unwrap. Next thing you know, we're watching the movie within hours. So, I mean, I didn't have a lot of time and build up. I had missed all the praise for this movie, if you will, and I was completely taken by it. I like mystery movies. I didn't know they could even be this good. Like, I was really impressed by wanting to know what happened. There's certain plot elements I'm not going to give away on this part of the podcast before the spoilers that really blew my mind. And I was absolutely enamored and entrenched with it. And it's the visual scenery, too, and the atmosphere that this movie is outstanding. I think we had this with Casablanca a little bit. It feels like a period piece because it's like a piece of history. It is a time capsule to understand how Vienna would have been at this point in time. Kind of what you were pointing at, Michael. I didn't live in Vienna in the 40s, so I don't really know what it's like. So it's very, very interesting to me from a historical standpoint. It's not even like they're going back and doing homework and making an accurate movie now. It's made then. This is of its time, and I find that very interesting. I found Casablanca interesting for that reason, and I find this movie interesting for that reason. And that's just like 
sprinkles on what is an already amazing Sunday of just a great movie. I've shared this movie with a number of people. Sometimes they might say, I don't like old movies. And I'll be like, well, have you seen The Third Man? They're like, no. And you can kind of tell they don't want to. And it usually goes over pretty well. I do remember I took it and I showed it to my own father who hadn't seen it himself. And he loved it. But my sister and my brother-in-law we ended up looking at their phones the whole time. So I have seen it go both directions where somebody just refused to get into it. They're like, oh, you're watching an old black and white movie. That's too bad. And I was like, you're not giving this movie a fair shake. Yeah, it's amazing. Some people just don't want to watch a black and white movie. They're, I don't know if it's, they just think of it as being old and they're not going to like it because it's old. But if you give this movie a chance, I think you'll really like it. Agreed. I think that's so true. And there will be spoilers that lie ahead. And this is not a movie you want spoiled. Watch this movie. Take my advice. You're going to want to see this one. We will be back after these messages. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Jason. And this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi... We've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. Please subscribe and happy listening. All right, we are back, and this is your final morning. There will be spoilers that lie ahead. Lizzie, for those who haven't seen The Third Man since 1949, do you want to refresh people's memories? Post-World War II Vienna has been split into four quadrants. The Russians, the Americans, the English, and the French. The city has been devastated by crime. It's here we meet Holly Martin, an American novelist bound to meet his childhood friend Harry Lyme. And upon arrival, Holly immediately learns that Harry has been hit by a truck and died. He attends Harry's funeral. He encounters some men eyeing him suspiciously, along with a beautiful woman who pays no attention to him. Holly decides to use his allure as a writer to buy time in Vienna and look into Harry's death and meets the major players in his case. First, Major Calloway, a policeman who claims Harry was a murderer and a racketeer and is better off dead. Baron Kurtz a friend of Harry's that claims that he was there when Harry was struck. Harry was about to greet their mutual friend outside his flat when Harry was hit and died instantly. The two men then carried Harry to the sidewalk before the arrival of Dr. Winkle, who pronounced Harry dead on sight. Third, Anna Schmidt, the beautiful woman from the funeral, and Harry's lover. She is in despair of the loss over her lover, whom Holly is now falling for. Fourthly, the porter outside Harry's flat. The porter confirms that Harry died instantly, but claims that three men, not two, carried Harry to the street. This leaves Holly certain that he is being lied to. Frustrated, Holly is tired and makes his way back to Calloway, and the two share what they know. Holly learns that Harry was involved in a penicillin racketeering scheme. Holly is now devastated, heading back to his hotel, but not before he sees the shadow of Harry. Holly now knows, and he is certain, more than ever, that Harry is alive. And now we know the mystery has been solved. The porter was telling the truth all along. There was a third man carrying Harry across the street. Only, it was not Harry that they were carrying. Harry was the third man. The man that they were carrying across the street was Joseph Harbin, innocent collateral damage, a military hospital worker, that they were carrying across the street. Holly teams up with Major Calloway to catch Harry. Much to Anna's disgust. After a long chase in the sewer, Harry is shot. Now Harry is gone, and Holly takes his final chances with Anna, who simply walks away, paying no attention to him, much like their first encounter. I feel like if you want definition of cold shoulder, that is that ending. Oh my gosh, yes. (laughs) I had no idea how how that was going to end. You know, she was just walking. It was a beautiful scene with the big trees and I thought that that was going to end of you know he's lighting a cigarette and maybe she just decides to bum one off of him and then it cuts to black but she was ice queen she's remarkably consistent (laughs) (laughs) in Britain 
this movie was overwhelmingly positively praised. And in Austria, the local critics were kind of underwhelmed. Despite it having a museum today, they kind of felt like this was a troubled relationship with its own past at the time. So it had to grow into being a classic. To this day, there is a permanent spot for it in the Birkingo Theater, and it is played three times a week, and it's still shown actively in Vienna at any given moment. So this movie means a lot, if you will, to so many that people want to go to Vienna. They want to travel. They want to see this museum. They want to see it in Vienna, so much so that it still plays to this day. Michael, what is it that this movie has this grip on people? This is an unusual level of fandom. You know, it is, but the movie is such a complete work of art from the script to the setting to the casting, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Every single character is just perfect in the role that they play. The music, and then you have this incredible cinematography, which if you watch it casually without foreknowledge of what you're seeing, it can slip right by you, but it will affect you. We'll talk about it a little bit later, I I assume, but the so-called Dutch angle of the camera, it sneaks up on you and it adds attention to the movie that is just not there in a lot of other movies. Great mysteries unfold in other movies, but they don't create the constant tension that this movie has. And I think a, a big, big part of that is the setting in the they don't talk about it that much except at the very beginning of the movie uh, and they refer to the Russian section a couple of times the Russians are going to deport Anna back to Czechoslovakia they talk about that some but the setting of Austria where you have a whole nation that is trying to come to terms with its own dealings with the Nazis and now they're occupied country and they they have a lot of freedom they can enjoy doing a lot of things but they are occupied. They're occupied by four different countries in four different segments of the city. It's just such a complete work of art. And I think that's why it appeals to people on so many different levels in so many different ways. Lizzie, what do you think about our villain here? We talked about Harry Lyme being ranked very highly, number 39 on the yeah. all-time villains list. Oh, man. I mean, we have, we have a really good bad guy, don't we? Yeah, he's so bad. So what I loved about this movie is I sit down, Aaron and I are watching it, and we operate under the assumption that there's going to be a third man. You know, I think that that movie would, it wouldn't be quite as fun if you're like, oh, you're right, I was mistaken, and just moves on with his day. So we knew that there would be a third man. We're immediately trying to guess who. And once it's revealed that Harry is alive, we still don't quite, fully understand. We know what he's been up to, but because we've never seen him before, it's really hard for us to wrap our brains around that. So that first, first encounter where he runs away, you're still thinking that there's a possibility that maybe he's a good guy. And this was all just a big misunderstanding. But then it's after when he meets with Calloway, Holly does, and he learns about the penicillin racketeering that, oh, wait, hold on. This guy's like really, really bad news. And then when they have that encounter at the Ferris wheel and he's like, Of course I don't care to look at the victims. I mean, look down at all these like little dots. Like, would it really matter if any of these dots just stopped breathing? It's apathy, like true, like indifference. Like he's not, he's evil because there is zero conscience. And that to me is almost, I honestly find someone that is wicked and just wants to see like anarchy, I find that almost less frightening than someone who just truly does not care. He's just like, I'm only self-serving. I have no conscience, no apathy. Like if you stop breathing, like as long as I get paid, I don't really care. Like that's a very, very evil person through and through. And you know, Harry is talked about all throughout the movie, but Orson Welles' character only appears on the screen for about 10 minutes in the entire movie. And yet, he makes the list of worst villains. I think part of it is because of what he was doing. But I think you're right, Lizzie. The few minutes that Orson Welles is on camera, he is just personification of not necessarily of evil, but of total apathy toward the rest of humanity. He could absolutely care less about every other human being that's down there, those little dots that are down there when they're up in the Ferris wheel. That's yeah, reckless. It's a, like that person is like, I have, you are so unpredictable and you have nothing to lose. So, I mean, I just, it's very frightening. I think the movie does a very interesting thing in how he presents Harry Lyme to you or how he's presented as a character. He's a cool guy. Hey, I, you've been out of work and you need to come over. I'll pay for you. You come over here. We're old buddies. 
this woman you meet loves Harry Lime. Like, with all that she can love somebody, she certainly loved Harry Lime. People like Harry Lime. They want to be around him. And you, as a viewer, start to kind of become won over by that. You're upset that he's dead. You, it turns into a murder mystery for who killed Harry Lime. And the first half the movie, or third of it anyway, is about who killed Harry Lime. And you're invested in that because you like Harry. And it's really weird for Joseph Cotton's character, Holly, to see that his friend, this is his friend. Like, this is, this is wild to me. So Chad and Fry, who host the show with us, if they broke the law, I'd totally be like, I don't know where they are. Or, you know, or I, would, I would look the other way. But it's harder and harder for Holly to do that. His old friendship does tend to eat at him as he starts to sit there and realize these victims are children who are being medicated for antibiotics and it's making them sicker. And it's, it's just so bad. This isn't a speeding ticket. This isn't I bootlegged and sold people some booze. There are really bad consequences to this. And it does sit with Holly so bad that he doesn't want to betray his friend. Anna doesn't want to betray Harry. And that's admirable in its own way. She's not going to snitch on him. But on the other hand, it's really repugnant. It has to be strong enough. And that's why it's so incredibly well written. That there's a really good moral dilemma that Holly has to confront. And you as a viewer have gone on this road with him as he's discovered each part of this. That's excellent storytelling, excellent pacing, and it maximizes each one of those pieces for that. I know I spoke to Chad offline. He said this movie seemed predictable to him, and I don't see how it's possible, but even if you have seen this before, I would say it doesn't matter if you know Harry Lime's life. I've seen this movie enough times where this movie is so tightly written all the details only accentuate and tighten the puzzle so that when you see the full picture of it, you appreciate it. It's like walking around the Madonna. Like, I've seen the picture in a book. It's a nice sculpture. But if you see it in person, it's got to be a powerful experience. And so to watch how this movie's crafted, I got to say, it's really, really good. If only there were other movies that could handle that. And that's not just the cinematography and presentation and setting. Those things are amazing. Its writing is also phenomenal from a writing standpoint. And it's directed amazingly well. It's well it said. It really is. There's a, a scene where Anna asks Holly to tell her about Harry. He doesn't talk very much, but he, he does get out this line. He says something like, Harry just made everything fun. But there's also a scene where he's talking about uh, I think he's actually talking to Harry at the time, and he makes some sort of uh, allusion to the fact that Harry left him hanging, and maybe part of the reason that he's kind of down on his luck now. It doesn't fill that out in any way, but it's one of those things where Holly likes Harry so much and likes being around Harry so much that he's willing to overlook the fact that maybe Harry wasn't always as good to Holly as he should have been. Yeah, it's like that toxic friendship, right? Where that person brings so much fun to the table that you don't always see that this person is manipulating and like almost gaslighting you to believing that they're actually a really good friend when they're not. And yeah, it's and it is really crazy. And you you do see the charm because even though the apathy is there and as a viewer it's very scary, he's saying everything with this charm to it. Yeah. So you can see and appreciate because it's like a salesman almost, right? Where it's, if I'm talking to you as a believer in this product, then you too are going to believe that this product is worth buying. And the way that he's talking about it is so casual and so assured that I can appreciate, even though we know what he's talking about is horrible things, that if you would, this was your childhood friend, that it would be very challenging to hear him talk like that and not at least get confused. I just think when we meet, the other people were part of this. Dr. Winkle? Winkle. Winkle. Is, is he quick? I, I, this movie has such great mispronunciations of names on purpose. And, and Kurtz is the other one. These guys are such bad guys. From the moment you meet them, it's evident there's treachery afoot. Again, you think Harry's been killed and that these guys are covering it up. And so I like that angle a lot, too. They're very, very strong with their bad guys. And when you meet Harry... Like you said, he's disarming. It does almost seem, doesn't seem congruent. Harry wouldn't hang out with these guys. Harry's even fun. You're right, as he talks about a murderous plot. He even has this charismatic way of saying, like, if one of those dots should stop moving, would you really be that upset, old boy? And, like, it's just so smooth. And yes. so 
Orson Welles is really good in this. He, as you pointed out, Michael, he's not in the movie that much, but he carries this clout as an actor. I mean, this is a big name, even by today's standards. Joseph Cotton, for many, is completely forgotten. And in a weird way, it's kind of good that it's cast that way. You want Harry Lyme to have that magnetism from the cast. Hmm. It's interesting. Cotton is really underappreciated. I didn't appreciate it until further watching that you go on this journey with him. But he has to take a step back as an actor because, like you said, Harry Lyme is this movie is a Harry Lyme movie, even though it's not even about him. He's the protagonist and he is somehow a supporting actor. That's a unique position to be put in as an actor. Yes. Yeah, well, if Kurtz, for example, has this sliminess to him that you're almost uneasy when you hear him talk because he is almost snake-like in the way that he, he'll he kind of like lean in closer and the cadence of his voice, he's like, no, like, why don't you come? Like, oh, this, everything's okay. Like, you know, he just has this very like, come over to the Casanova Club. Or like, you caught me. I got to make a living somehow. Like, he's just very icky. And if you had somebody like that playing Harry Lime, then it would just be a no-brainer. Like, there wouldn't be any kind of moral dilemma there. And Harry has to be charming and likable because that, that's where the juxtaposition comes in of making this whole thing so complicated for, for Holly. You mentioned Joseph Cotton earlier, and he is, I think, largely forgotten. When people talk about the, the great actors, I don't think you would hear his name brought up in very many conversations. But if you look at his films, he has been in some of the greatest movies. He was, of course, in, played a, a huge role in Citizen Kane. And he played, he was in another Orson Welles movie, The Magnificent Ambersons. And in a way, in the Magnificent Ambersons and, and slightly in Citizen Kane, he plays kind of the same character that he plays in The Third Man. And by the same character, I, I don't mean, you know, precisely, but he plays this slightly downtrodden, slightly sad person who is ultimately a really good heart. And he plays that part so well. It's just really incredible. And he's done that in a number of movies. He can also turn it around the other way, though. He's also in Shadow of a Doubt, the Hitchcock film noir classic. I don't know if you know that movie or not, but in that movie, he plays the villain. And he does an exceptional job of playing the villain in that movie. He's a phenomenal actor, in my opinion. Just phenomenal. I understand that he and Valley, the, the female lead in the movie, were kind of forced on the director by David O. Selznick. Selznick had those two under contract, and he kind of forced those two to be in the movie. I don't know who might have been cast otherwise, but I don't know how they could have been any better. Carol Reed wanted James Stewart, Jimmy Stewart. For, really? For, yeah, for Holly Martins, which I rarely say this, but this movie is so perfect, I'm not even sure I need Jimmy Stewart because it's so good. I think you're right in that what he must do, Cotton, that is, he, he makes a career, as you pointed out, that's three times that you just named that he is the understated companion to Orson Welles so that Orson Welles can have this amazing impact. He's like the Ringo star to his, yes. <laughs> to his John Lennon, you know? I mean, it's like he shines so that the other one can shine even brighter. But I mean, that's yes. an important part. This movie demands that performance out of him. And Ringo Starr actually is a good drummer, by the way. I don't mean that to slight him. I just, he's surrounded by geniuses, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Cary Grant was the other one who was considered for the role of Harry Lyme. And Cary Grant is a big time player as well. Other names such as Noel Coward, David Niven, Robert Taylor, and Robert Mitchum were considerations as well. Again, when I've seen it work so well, it's really hard to change it, even though that's an amazing list of names. And I'll be honest with you, it's a pretty cushy acting gig. Like you said, you get to go to Vienna. And you don't have to actually act in it that much. And as we saw with Orson Welles, he didn't want to go down in the sewers. So he was a bit of a prima donna and didn't necessarily cooperate very well. Furthermore, he took his own film crew with him over to Vienna so that he could shoot Othello at the same time, which was not planned. And so that's a total star-powered, I'm Orson Welles, I can do what I want to. But you know diva. what? Yeah, he was a diva. But you know what? <laughs> We've all sat here and said he did a great job. Sometimes yep. you let Aretha Franklin sing. You, you know, I mean, you just, sometimes you just have to let that diva be a diva and you put up with it. Why? Because they're really good and he delivers. Right. So 
at least he was worth putting up for. He, and some of the great dialogue moments, such as the, the cuckoo clock line of like, we were given democracy and what was what did you really have? The cuckoo clock. That line was, the, Orson Welles peppers that in there. Or in the, the spiel when they're up in the Ferris wheel, talking about all those dots moving around. What if one should stop moving? That's Orson Welles. He's adding that stuff into the script, so he does a lot with a little. You know, mm-hmm. you didn't give him much, but he sure delivered every bit of it and then spades. So He sure did. David Oselznik was insistent that the filmmakers also use Alita Valley for the female role. And she gets a little bit lost with Orson Welles' cloud on this one. She's excellent in this one, isn't she? Mm-hmm. She really she's, is. She's great. She's really good. You can tell she's so conflicted. And she's almost like drunk by the grief and love that she feels for Harry that it's hard to know really where she stood in terms of how much she knew. You know, did she know the full extent of what Harry was doing? Did she care? And you almost kind of gather that she probably knew that he was up to something despicable and didn't want to know the full extent of it, of like, if I can dig my head in the sand and just continue to think of you as a great guy, I'm going to do that. But you could just tell that she was very conflicted, but at the end of the day, like her love of Harry, like ended up winning over everything else. Yeah, she went on to make several of the movies. She had a long career after this and was very successful, but almost all those movies were made in Europe. But I think she does an absolutely phenomenal job here. And I think that the fact that her face is not one that you instantly know, if it had been some actress that had a a big career in the U.S. or in the U.K. and a big reputation, it would have been harder for an actress like that to pull off the complete sadness that she seems to just be overwhelmed with. And she goes on stage and she plays these comedy roles and she's so flippant on stage and so buoyant and so happy and so smiley. And as soon as she walks off stage, it's just like a switch goes off and she's back to her miserable self. And when I say miserable, I don't mean that she's a miserable person. I mean, she's just so sad that she's so grief stricken that she seems to be having a hard time just making tea or coffee. She Mm. said, uh, he's dead and I wish I were too. That's a heavy line to actually have to deliver, but she conveys this unspoken pain really, really well. She does. You know, I think it's interesting. Producer David Oselznik really wanted her to be a piece of meat, if you will. So when we covered The Killers, Ava Gardner's character is stunning. Her iconic image is part of what we remember from that movie. Well, that's what he was going for here. But Carol Reed and producer Alex Corda, as well as Alita Valley, didn't feel that was right for this character in this grieving moment. And they all agreed and they overruled and they kind of got their way here. I'm wondering, Michael, you said this movie is sometimes overlooked. I think the noir formula has that femme fatale in there so much. And she is a femme fatale. But this is a different kind of femme fatale than what we saw with Barbara Stanwyck in Double Indemnity or Ava Gardner in The Killers when we covered these movies. These movies, it is a devilish woman who's luring you into something terrible. She's not telling Holly, I'm going to ruin you. She compels him to be connected to her. It drives him to go deeper and deeper and deeper into this when he ought not. Several people have warned him, you should just go home, Holly. This isn't your thing. You're not a policeman. Mm -hmm. Leave death for the professionals. And he doesn't. And she's really a driving force for that, which is why it's such an interesting character and how it's written. But to your point, I think you said, Michael, that this is movies written more complex. I think it's presented in a less simple manner. The fact that they didn't just parade her out there in a red dress actually might cheapen the character and what she does for the story in many ways. And I'm glad that Carol Reed, good director, by the way, great director, Mm -hmm. knew that that wasn't the right way to go with this. And then also Selznick wanted that happy ending. He wanted them to be together at the end. So Selznick clearly didn't know what to do with his character because he, he seemed to be wrong with everything to do with Anna. Michael, do you want a happy ending here? Later on, you're probably going to ask me for my favorite scene in the movie. The ending is my favorite scene in the movie. I think that if it had ended in almost any other way, it wouldn't have just sort of reeled me in and bound me by both feet and both hands the way it has. 
Because when she walks by and she doesn't even give him a glance, it's just so cold. And you have no idea what the future holds for either one of them. If she had even looked over at him, then your thought would have been, they're going to get together. They're going to get together and live happily ever after. But the movie leaves you with him obviously deeply in love with her, but with her completely, I wouldn't say indifferent to him. You don't know how she feels about him. I think she's just pretty spiteful. I think she does not like him. Yes. I think if it had had a happy ending, I'm not sure I would be here saying what a great movie it is. It would still be a great movie probably, but it, it would be so different if it had ended in any other way. And one of the things that just really caught me about it was how long the ending takes. Because the whole time that she's walking toward him, and I say toward him, the whole time she's walking down the middle of the street where he happens to be standing on the side, I don't know how long it takes in the movie. The movie's only an hour and 33 minutes long. And don't make me go there because one of the gripes I have with so many modern movies is they're just too long. This movie tells an incredibly intricate story in an hour and 33 minutes in an incredible way. And I think most modern movies would be better off if they compress themselves down and try to figure out a way to tell their story in a little less time than two and a half hours. There's a place for movies like that. Some of my favorite movies are like that. I just saw Gandhi a week ago or so. There's a place for long movies like that. But a lot of the real classics are 95 minutes long, 100 minutes long. This one's an hour and 33 minutes long. So it's 93 minutes long. And it tells this incredibly complex, rich story in a way that I just love. The powerful perspective. It's one point perspective. She's walking at the camera. To your point, Carol Reed has amazing patience. I could almost see Alfred Hitchcock nodding, saying like, good, make you wait. That's suspense. You, yeah. you, yes. you, you want to know where this is going as a viewer, and you're just letting them linger there a little bit. It's the flambe at the table, like where you're making that, and you're, you're saying like, this Bananas Foster is going to be pretty good, won't it? Huh? Is it going to be? When, when she first starts walking, she must be a quarter of a mile yeah. away from him. I don't think it's completely real time, but it's pretty close to real time where she's walking down the street to him. Like you said, the patience of the director to let that scene unfold the way it did is just incredible. Another thing that I really liked is that it shows you that doing the right thing doesn't always feel right. She's mad at him. He doesn't get the girl. He has to go home. He has no money in his pocket. This is in many ways a loss for him. His friend is now dead. And he was directly involved with giving him up. That's actually a whole lot. That's the opposite of a happy ending. And yet, Holly can still sleep at night knowing that those children in that hospital were properly given justice. That the person who was doing such evil things, number 39 villain of all time, rightfully so, right. has been shut down. And that you still have to do even when it doesn't feel good. I, I, I well, don't know. I like That's a moral dilemma. That's very compelling to watch. I think you said that, well, all he has is his conscience to say that I did the right thing. Boy, it doesn't feel good. There's a happy ending in there, though, with with that exact point of, you know, even though having to turn in your friend and and go through all of the fall deeply in love with this woman and have her be almost disgusted by you, it's, it's a lot of hardship there. But Based on what you were saying earlier, Dad, about how we don't actually know how long of a chokehold Harry has had on Holly, that this is very likely that since they've been children, that Harry has had this almost like psychological Jedi mind control over Harry, where no matter what Harry will say or do, Holly is just always going to be his loyal companion. And I think there is a happy ending. And Now, even though all of these things have unfolded the way they have, Holly is going home with 2020 vision. And now maybe finally that chokehold has been lifted. And he just, he sees that for what he is. That's the only guiding light that you have is that he's sending home just saying, you know what? This was a really bad time, (laughs) but at least I don't ever have to, I can lay my head down knowing that I've done the right thing. And this person that's just had a hold on me forever I now see very clearly who they are. Based on your happy ending, you don't think Holly stayed in Vienna and pursued Anna 
I think you would have to have a lot of gumption to go after her after that. I mean, that is like rejection at its finest. So I have no idea. There is a world where maybe he goes to the Casanova club and finds her in the right moment. But I think he hops out of the car on the way to the airport with every intention of going home, sees her, gets out. And I'm thinking, if that were me at least, I'd be like, okay, (laughs) clearly I know where you stand. And I think maybe I just need to let this lie and go home. I don't think I would have the courage after being rejected so intensely. But uh, yeah, so I, I, I think he goes home. I think it's a long plane ride home myself. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stewing, a lot of stewing. But yeah, that scene is so powerful because it's so tense. But going back to what you were saying earlier, Russ, I want to hit the point of well, they're not being a femme fatale. Like, it's so consistent. You know, like she is heartbroken. I also think that the storytelling is richer when you don't actually know where Anna stands in terms of Harry's character. You know, we know that she's madly in love with him, but we don't understand her level of involvement with this racketeering scheme. So we don't want to necessarily, like, we don't have enough to label her as evil. And she is trying to pull Harry in, but it's, or excuse me, Holly in, but it's not to necessarily take Holly down, it's really more to just have answers as to what's happened to Harry and try to see if she can get her life back. It's it's really just self-serving in that way. And I think if she were to be the seductress, the writing would be a little bit more predictable in that way. And so then, of course, at the end, for them not to get together, it just feels like more in alignment, like her loyalty is to Harry, dead or alive. It helps that you as a viewer see that she doesn't mean very much to Harry on the Ferris wheel. You know, we do see Holly say, and what about Anna? Come on now. And he's just like, mm, sorry, old boy. <laughs> you understand. And like, he's just, he's ready and very dismissive of her as well. She didn't see that. If she had a recording of that, it was this whole thing would go down differently. But we as a viewer understand he didn't feel the same way about you that you felt about him. No. And I think it's on the Ferris wheel when Harry tells Holly or actually Holly kind of figures out from what Harry is saying that Harry gave Anna's name to the Russians. And Harry is, he can kind of go more freely in the Russian zone. And it's pretty obvious that he has no loyalty to Anna or he wouldn't have given, or if he does, he values his own skin more than he values his relationship with Anna, or he would never have turned over Anna's name to the Russians so the Russians could deport her to Czechoslovakia. Yeah. My personal view is that there's several mentions in the movie, uh, particularly by people like uh, Popescu. Am I pronouncing his name correctly? I think so. He says he makes some references to the fact that Vienna is just a dangerous place. And I think it's uh, Baron Kurtz who says that he sold some tires once and he has to kind of keep a low profile with the law. And there's another reference somewhere to the fact that everybody in Vienna is selling cigarettes or doing something that they're not supposed to be doing. So I think Anna undoubtedly knew that Harry was involved with the black market somehow. I don't want to think that she knew what he was actually doing because I don't want to think that she would have tolerated that. I think she was more compassionate than that. But I think she definitely knew that he was in the underworld in Vienna. But she probably said, so is everybody else. And he makes me laugh. My cat likes him. And <laughs> and he got my papers. He he fixed my papers so I could it wouldn't be deported by the Russians. So she owes him big and from that standpoint, for sure. Yeah. No, that's all. It's a really, really good point. She probably did know, just not the full extent of, of how bad it was. Yeah. Yeah. You think somebody's smuggling watches in. Like you said, my threshold for what I won't turn my friends in is actually super high. What's so well written is that this does take you to the point of just like, ugh, you're hurting sick people. Yeah. It's pretty. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Mothers and, and little kids. Yeah. It's like why yeah. you could almost see him like sitting there looking at him and going like why this? And he's like he's like have you seen your victims? And he's like I don't really like thinking about that term victims. And it's like yeah, you make it sound bad. I just love the texture of the people that we get in this one. The Vienna Police Department's all over this thing. The actual sanitation workers are actual people there. The balloon man is an actual guy. Like 
So many of these people are so excited to help this movie out. They're out there shooting the streets down with water. That's how we get all these amazing reflections. Carol Reed was brilliant to figure out how to get light. And, you know, one of the things that this black and white medium is doing for you is you're getting these really low-key lighting is where these have these really hard shadows. And that is the atmosphere that you need. That, that conveys the seediness of the black market and of this climate that we're in. It's one of the darkest, blackest movies I've ever seen, and it is incredibly effective with that style. It sure is. And I love the contrast. I might even go as far to say is this is the best looking black and white movie I've ever seen. The camera works that good. It, it is. I think I would is. agree with that. Yeah, it's really fabulous. And again, if you watch it, particularly if you watch it a second time, because the first time, I promise listeners, if you watch it the first time and you just watch it as a mystery movie, you'll be so captivated that you'll want to go back and look at some of the incredible scenes that are in there. And the way the camera is set up in so many of the scenes adds such an edge to the feeling that you get from watching the movie. And it's so subtle. It's not like it's jarring or anything like that. It doesn't take control of the scene. It's just in the background, but it adds such an edge to the movie. It's like your hair is always on, like it's a constantly standing up in the back of your neck. Like this entire movie, you're on edge a little bit. And I do think that that really contributes to it, just the darkness. And then you have it juxtaposed with the music, which is almost playful. That juxtaposition also just adds to the uneasy. Like you're always just slightly uneasy throughout the whole film. You know, you guys may know better than me, but I think an excerpt from the score was actually a a big hit record for a long time. And the music stands alone by itself. It's beautiful music. But when you watch the movie, the music actually takes on almost a character of itself because when Harry Lyme is about to appear for the first time, the music hits this sort of, I'm not a musical person, but it hits kind of a crescendo. Uh, It gets really fast, really high pitched, and you know something is going to happen. And the score just plays with the rest of the movie perfectly, I think. Oh, absolutely. There's nothing like it. I remember the first time thinking this is a bold decision. And Maybe even there were some moments when I did watch it the first time where I'm just like, this isn't the right thing in this moment. It's not dark enough. But as I've watched it, the Anton Karras soundtrack is now so part of the recipe. I think it's wild that this movie was 11 weeks at number one on the U.S. Billboard bestsellers charts. This thing is an international super hit. Oh. This is on the radio. <laughs> it's hard to think of an instrumental piece in today's times resonating with people that much, but this is a massively popular piece. And Carol Reed, the director, just met Anton Karras by coincidence at a party in Vienna. He was there playing the zither. That's what this instrument, this wild, many stringed instrument's called. And he loved it. And he said, I got to have that in my movie. And he even brought him over to England and had him stay with him at his house. And they were very good friends. So Karras scored big at this party. <laughs> uh, I mean, he had an entire stardom based off of this movie and just. That was the right party to play. And he played his heart on at that party. And Carol Reed was the man to hear it. I think that's such an interesting story that that has taken on a life of its own. To your point, the music is huge. I I love uh, in the opening credits, you have the strings from the zither kind of run through the opening credits and they're vibrating as the uh, music plays. A lot of the film noir movies, uh, a lot of Hitchcock movies have great credits. The credits themselves are worth watching as a as kind of a standalone thing. And in this movie, the credits aren't up for very long. But I love the fact that they have the zither strings in the background of the credits. Yes. I love when they you really don't see this too much in modern movies, but this is one thing about classic movies that I really appreciate is I love that the music almost tells me how I'm supposed to be feeling. And you're like, okay, this is like an anxious moment. So like you said, we're going to be playing really, really fast and really, really loud. And, and in this movie, it certainly is more playful than others. And I think that really adds to the allure. But I just love a soundtrack that has a personality of its own. And this, for all the reasons we just mentioned, like certainly I think is at the top of that list of big personality soundtracks. I think it's really interesting. We talk about the atmosphere of this place. The writer, Graham Greene, the name that we haven't brought up very much here, had completed a successful film with Carol Reed, the director here, for The Fallen Idol. And they were nominated for an Academy Award for Best Director in that one and Best Adapted Screenplay. So 
they won a BAFTA on that one. So this is a winning combination here. And this is Graham Greene's only original screenplay. It's phenomenal. I wish he had written more. If you could write like this, I wish you just do nothing but write original screenplays because it's amazing. It's interesting. Green came to Vienna and this woman named Elizabeth Montagu took him around on tours. They showed the city sewers, the nightclubs, the streets, the less reputable places that you see in here. She introduced him to an investigator named Peter Smoleka, who was a Central European correspondent for the Times newspaper, and they showed them how the black market was working. And all of these things are constructing into what Graham Greene's doing. He had a skeleton about an idea about this character named Harry, who appears dead but then turns out not to be. And the city of Vienna is such an important part of this one. He's, uh, Green said, I had a story skeleton, but Vienna itself put the flesh on there. And if you were to remake this movie, you could even shoot it again in Vienna. It's time. When this was made is so essential. The scars of that decimated part of Europe is just amazing. I have to say that it's amazing all these people. Vienna itself is such a character to why this is so powerful. I can see why they have a museum for it there. Yes. And I can see why they could play it every day, because it's an interesting part of history that even Vienna today wouldn't be. And it's a really interesting part to capture on. It's like a time capsule, really, being able to watch it like that. And I know, of course, that and there was a lot of sensitivity back then, and I'm, I'm sure that there possibly could still be a lot of sensitivities to it now, but it is always, of course, important to know our history. And I think it's really interesting to see how Vienna was operating at that time. And you know, even like you were saying, like Baron Kurtz is, you know, he can't go into the hotel and he can't meet Holly at his hotel because he's Austrian. They have to meet in a cafe outside. And he you know, makes the point of, I have to be kind of strategic about where I meet you and and how I meet you because of the fact that I'm Austrian. And like you said, it wouldn't be nearly as difficult for Holly and all of the other big players of this movie to navigate around Vienna if it weren't for the fact that it was split into those different quadrants. So that really lends itself to allowing this movie to be so complex without it. It would still be a fantastic movie, but it just you're peeling a layer off that I think makes it really, really compelling. Yeah, one of the great parts about Vienna here is that the sewer system's outstanding. It's just, <laughs> I mean, I'm an architect, so just to see this infrastructure underground is just to take the filming there and to share that with the world. People go on tours, they have parties in the sewer, like dinner party kind of things. And I mean, th this is astounding. It really is an amazing place. And to capture all of that here, this is just really special. At one point, I was legit expecting the first time that they were running through the sewers, I was expecting them to find like a makeshift bedroom and that it turned out that like Harry just had been living under the sewer. And I mean, he might have been, but I think I was like fully, fully expecting some kind of Michael Myers situation where he just like lives in the sewer and like under a bed and or no, that would be Jason, like kind of like lives in in the sewers and just kind of comes out as he pleases. Freddy's boiler room, maybe? Yeah, that's, yes. The whole sewer scene, the first time they go down when Harry has disappeared and they figure out that he may have disappeared down into the sewer system when they go down in there and you, the massive size of it and to know that it's a real thing, it's not, it's not some made up set, although part of it may have been shot in a set because of Orson Welles not wanting to be in the sewers, but it's a real thing. It's, it's not a made-up thing in this gigantic size of it and the different passageways and connections. And uh, it just, it's just phenomenal to think that something could be like that. And then when you think about a character like Harry, he would be the one that would know how to maneuver through all of that. And he probably somewhere had a map that showed him how he could get from place to place and which connections to take. In fairness to Orson Welles, it, did, it is a sewer. It probably does smell bad. And he did say that this, I don't think it's healthy to sit down in here and breathe this. Nevertheless, like I said, people will take tours. It's a, it's a piece of history that people want to go check out. So they run sewer tours. So it's pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, Orson Welles did make them go back, to your point, to the Shepperton Studios in London to shoot his scenes. So if you see somebody in the sewer, it's the sewer. It's real. It's just somebody's stunt doubles back. Like, he's in shadow and in silhouette a ton. If you see his face, it's up closer, and it's a set. It's pretty simple when it's a set versus when it's not. So everybody else was willing to get down in the grime and the who knows what down there, but not so much him. It, 
<laughs> you know, speaking of the, the time when they find uh, the Harry may have gone down into the sewer, uh, the person who m makes that discovery is uh, Major Calloway, the Trevor Howard character. And again, with the casting of this movie, Trevor Howard is just plays the role of a stiff upper lip British sort of no nonsense, no emotion, cynical. You could tell that he really wants to get to the bottom of this Harry thing. And of course, he has no idea that Harry's still alive. He's just trying to get to the figure out who was in it with Harry at the beginning of the movie. But he plays the sort of British stiff upper lip, strictly by the book, cop. He's not really a cop. I guess he's a military person, but he's kind of a military cop. And he plays that role so perfectly. It's just mm -hmm. absolutely uh, uh, amazing to me how the cast works together. They just work so well. They do. He's a hard guy to sell out to because he is snobby. No. You know, you don't like him at first. No. You don't want to like him. And the fact that he has this news and it's accurate and you can see in the, the scene where there's a time lapse and Holly's like, ugh, okay, I get it. Yeah. It makes it harder. It, it's so humiliating in real life when you encounter those moments, whether it's a professor who you just really hate and who has a good point, or whether it's somebody at work who might be a bit of a rival to you. And it does suck when somebody, when you just don't want that person to be right. It's not even that they're right anymore. It's not even that you're wrong anymore. It's just that I don't want that person to be right anymore. And because it's played so well by Trevor Howard, that again, just great acting. And his buddy that moves around with him, Bernard Lee, Sergeant Payne, the cheerful guy who loves his oh, book. I loved him. I love this little character as well. I mean, he hits that's him sweet. in the face and he's incredibly nice to him two seconds later. No, that's, I that's mean... <laughs> He hits him and then he says, careful, and runs to grab him before he can fall. Right. I know. He he's a teddy bear. He's so polite. <laughs> I hated that he had to die in the end. I, again, I know. Um, this is M from Bond. I did not know this. So when Bond goes in the office in Britain to get his mission, that's Bernard Lee for all of the Connerys and all of Moore's era, like for all the old that. Bond movies. Yeah. I did not know huh. that this is a young Bernard Lee. So uh, that, I am a huge Bond fan. So upon studying this this time, I saw Bernard yes. Lee's down there, name down there. I was like, who is he? And I did not realize it's the big man with the tiny hat. <laughs> He's, he plays the perfect counterpoint from a personality standpoint to the Trevor Howard character because he's so cheerful and he's a fan of Holly. And it's, it's almost like the, the tougher the Trevor Howard character is on Holly the nicer his character is, the nicer the, the sergeant's character is. Yes, Holly. like personification of good cop and bad cop, like really, truly. Because like, you really don't know at first. I actually feel like Calloway is a red herring in some ways in the beginning of the film because you, you're operating under the assumption that Holly is your protagonist, and he very much is. But, you know, your first introduction to Calloway is being him side-eyeing Holly and then they go into the bar together and then they get in this brawl. And so you just, you kind of have your guard up with Calloway a lot. So you are really on this journey with Holly where as much effort as it takes Holly to humble himself to recognize that Calloway is actually a good guy and he's right. I think as a viewer, you kind of have to go through that journey mm -hmm. as well. And it's really, really fun. And, you, and it ends up paying off because you end up really liking him. And as he's driving to the airport, and he's like, you know, are you sure you want to get out of the car? At this point, you're on Callaway's side. At least I was. I was like, don't get out of the car. Just go. Just go. Get out of here. Because, Russell, you've been saying a couple of times that your your threshold is very high. And I'm just here to say that no one share anything with me. Dad, My dad can attest. Like, I, I, I will turn everyone in. I am so utterly afraid of getting in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that I... You steal a pack of gum from the grocery store. He did it. Like, I, I will not. I've told my husband before whenever we watch movies together and he's like, you know, would you, I was like, listen, I would stay married to you. I would support you. I love you, but I would absolutely turn you in. Like, we have three kids. Like, I'm not trying. Somebody's got to take care of them. Like, I <laughs> <laughs> wow i gotta be yeah. i gotta you're right i do need to be careful don't, with what, what don't tell me your secrets. <laughs> i know i need to be more careful i i admire many of anna's qualities like i said this movie this movie took me past my threshold on that one so i'm normally more like anna but graham green the writer 
really had a lot of high praise for Carol Reed. Again, they had worked on Fallen Idol prior to this, and they were heavily awarded for this one. But he said of him here as well, this is the only director I know who that particular warmth of human sympathy, extraordinary feeling for the right face of the right part, the exactitude of cutting, not the least important power of sympathizing with the author's worries, and the ability to guide him, meaning that he listens to the writers and the people who their vision for what this wants to be. At every stage of the film's production, that guidance went hand in hand with over-mindfulness and open collaboration and encouragement between Green and Carol. And this is just one of those things that I love to read when two minds click like this. The results really show here, but the writer has a lot of really positive things to say for them. He doesn't have as nice of things to say for David with Selznick. <laughs> they didn't get along on the ending necessarily, as I mentioned before. And Guy Hamilton, who was the assistant director, said that Orson Welles had irritated people on the set, but also Oselznik was a strong character. Even his own son said he was a bit of a parody of himself at this point. And they were, Green and Carol Reed were not as impressed by him, and that he was difficult and overbearing. And unfortunately, Guy Hamilton, like I said, uh, would even mock him. He was on Benzedrine, which is Speed, or Amphetamine. I was sad to read that Reed had also resorted to this one. So he was a very slow director. And so he had to have multiple camera units and he was getting about two hours of sleep per day. This is a six week long shoot. And so I do hate to see that uh, the director was resorting to speed and the producer as well to keep themselves moving to make this amazing thing happen. They were up against the, the, the change of seasons. If they had waited too long, they have a big snow. The fall in this end wasn't actually fall. They had to have people throw leaves with fans so that they could get the leaves to fall the way they wanted to. It is a harder movie to make than we know necessarily. And I hope they didn't end up in some massive amphetamine addiction after this. Yikes. Although he, he yeah. went on to make a lot of movies after that. So maybe, maybe the speed led to all those movies, but uh, he did make a lot of movies after that. We also got to call out Scorsese wrote his master's thesis on this film. And he only got a B plus, and his professor looked down on this film saying, it's just some thriller. Like, this is, this is just schlocky. And you seem to think too highly of it, Martin Scorsese. Who will you go on to be? So, uh, um, Vince Gilligan, the creator and executive producer of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, said this is his favorite film. And Akira Kurosawa, a Seven Samurai, said this is one of his top favorite films. Michael Caine said it's his favorite movie. Jack White, the musician, named his record label the Third Man Records after this movie. So wow. a lot of people really loved this. And a lot of them, you would think, would be from German Expressionism. But Robert Krasser said that this is new objectivity, which was influencing him here. I see German Expressionism all over this wing. You pointed out, Michael, the Dutch angle. Mm -hmm. It makes you feel uneasy. We covered The Exorcist, and William Friedkin moves the camera in and out, mm -hmm. zooming constantly, and there's this unsettling feeling, even before, there's probably 45 minutes before anything goes wrong in The Exorcist. Friedkin, as a director, puts you on edge, and it's one of the best jobs I've ever seen of just simply using a camera to make the audience feel an intended way. Well, this movie puts you on edge in a different way. All those tilts make you feel uncomfortable, and as you watch it, Holly is almost always on the downhill of the tilt. He's at a disadvantage in these scenes. And when your sublime runs this through, you don't know it right away. Once you watch the movie several times over, you start to pick up on the tricks of the trade, but it feels really good. You don't have to know that that's a Dutch angle or an oblique angle. It feels really good. There's more scenes that have that tilt on there. And sometimes it's wildly tilted and it's masterful. It's just really, really well used because it makes you feel like you're on a three-legged stool and one of those legs doesn't hit the ground the way yes. it should or something like that. And that's exactly what it's supposed to do. I could see someone trying to emulate this and failing miserably, but Robert Crasser here just does an amazing job. You know, another technique that they use, I'm thinking of the scene in particular where Holly is talking with Baron Kurtz and the camera comes right up on Baron Kurt's face fills the whole scene. And it's one of those things where he, he will do that occasionally in the movie. He'll close up, close in so tightly on a face. And it's like when a person stands too close to you, it's makes yes. you edgy. <laughs> I, 
you can just tell that's not the kind of person I want standing that close to me. And I think that's another <laughs> really good technique that he uses. He doesn't use it a lot, but he, he uses it enough to, uh, to keep you on edge. Yes, agreed. They do a lot of close-ups on Harry towards his main parts of the film, and I completely agree with that. Like, it makes you unsettled, almost as if you're trying, you're being put in Holly's position, almost. David Oselznik replaced the narration at the beginning of this one. This is the version I have seen. So when I say I've seen this, I'd be curious to see the other version out there. So 11 minutes are cut off of this. American versions, you get a more polished Holly. So he is a darker, more um, drunk, self-pitying, kind of bumbling hero. A lot of this is trimmed off from the version that I got. And I know that I got this version because in the beginning, they give the you dumb Americans need to understand how Vienna is split up into four regions and this is how it works. And so I need that because I am a dumb American and I need that explanation. I'm curious, have either of you seen this other version where we get a darker Holly? I'm not sure I want it. I've seen the movie seven or eight times, uh, at least all the way through. And I honestly don't know that I have seen more than one version. So I'm probably watching the American version. But in the narration at the beginning, it's only for two minutes, very short. Yeah. And it's not clear who the narrator is. Joseph Cotton. So in the original version of the longer one, Carol Reed, the director, actually read it himself. And it's not a spoon feeding the narration at the beginning. But David Oselznik felt like this was just a necessity at the beginning. And so he replaces it with a narration read by Joseph Cotton, nearly 11 minutes of Milne gets cut in this one as well. We'll go on a quest now to find the, uh, the original director's cut. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's on YouTube somewhere or something. There's got to be some... At least some... the beginning is probably there. Yeah. Yeah, if you buy a Blu-ray, I'm sure you can get that. It's 11 minutes added back in. Yeah. I'm so happy with the way it is. Well, I, I love it the way it is too, so... Yeah. I don't think I'm interested in seeing a darker Holly either. I think if he was a darker character, then I think you wouldn't be able to associate him. I not as a slight to him, but he's kind of weak a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just this kind of down on his luck guy, and you can see that he's kind of easily swayed and pushed around. And I think a lot of that is just due to the fact that he's kind of a, you know, he's just a, a drunkard who is just trying to find his next paycheck. And so somebody like that is, you know, you can, is pretty malleable. So I understand that. But if he's a darker person, then you almost feel like all of that kind of gets taken away. And now you want to go on a deeper quest to figure out why he is the way he is, why he has this relationship with Harry and the moral dilemma piece that comes into it. I feel like it complicates it in a way that it just does not need to be. I think that it's, his character truly is humble in the best way. And I think darkening it a little bit would almost take, take the darkness out of, out of Harry. And you really need that in order for this story to work. Mm -hmm. Do you guys want to hand out some awards? Yes, let's do it. Michael, who's the MVP of this movie that you love so much? Uh, Carol Reed is the MVP. It, the movie is just so tightly put together. I assume he had a, a huge role in editing it but so tightly put together. You could also say that uh, Graham Greene is the MVP. The, the script itself is just so masterful. The way that the mystery is rolled out a little bit at a time, it's just one of the most masterful uh, pieces of, of writing I've ever seen in a movie. But in the end, I think that it's got to be the director. It's just a complete work of art. There used to be a, a movie reviewer in Lexington, Kentucky, and he used to review all of his movies as entertainment and as art. And sometimes he would rate a movie very high as art and not so great as entertainment. Sometimes it would be great entertainment. I'd say that would be more frequently. He would say, this movie's great entertainment, but it's not really that artful. It's fun to watch, but it's not an, a piece of art. This movie is entertaining and it is a piece of art. No great. question in my mind. Lizzie, how about you? Who's your MVP? I put Orson Welles. I think that the character of Harry, you don't think that you're going to ever meet Harry. And then you realize that Harry is alive. And then there's this tension that's being built between knowing that Harry is out there. And then when you finally do get to meet Harry, and it really pays off with Orson Welles. I had no idea what to expect. 
in that encounter with him, but he, for the limited time that he is on the screen, he completely steals the entire show. And it is, it's masterful. Like his apathy is chilling and it's just so well done. Mm. Those are great choices. And those were really where my one and two would be. And I would normally say Carol Reed too, because when a movie this well is clicking so well that everything is going this well, it's usually the director who's overseeing it. I'm just going to be different and say Robert Krasker, the cinematographer. I already said at one point, this movie is the prettiest black and white movie and the best executed cinematography I've ever seen in black and white. And to be honest with you, I don't mean to diminish it like in saying like black and white, that's a second class thing. I do think they're different. And I think that I've seen some beautiful color movies and, and such. So this movie is just one of the best pieces of cinematography. I have ever seen. So I'm going to go with Robert Krasker, even though Carol Reed is outstanding here. Graham Greene, too. I mean, this is a hard movie to award. Yes, <laughs> it is. Michael, who's your best supporting? You know, I, I would go with Trevor Howard. Uh, again, I think he just plays the perfect foil for Harry in a way, or, or for Holly in a way, because Holly is a little bumbling, a little drunk, very unsure of himself. And Trevor Howard's character is just nothing but business. He knows what he wants. He's after it. N nothing seems to phase him. Holly takes a swing at him, and he says, you know, take him to the hotel and put him up for the night and get him a plane ticket out of here. Uh, he's just uh, so all business that uh, I think he does a great job in, the, in that role. Just at the bottom of everything, Martins, leave death for the professionals. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. I really like that line that he delivered. I also love that this is another one of those mispronunciations. Holly keeps calling him Callahan. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. you can just see he doesn't like him. Lizzie, best supporting. I had Trevor Howard as well. I really love him. I think he's a perfect red herring for the first half of the movie because Holly doesn't like him. You as the viewer kind of inherently dislike him as well. And he grows on you a lot as the movie moves forward, even before the entire mystery is solved. At this, I, I found myself easing to this place where I actually really liked Trevor and, or excuse me, Calloway's character. And to your point, Dad, he has this like really, really strong moral fiber that's revealed throughout the film, and I, I find that really charming. You know, I, I know that. Because he is all business, it can make him somewhat dislikable that he's going to do the right thing no matter what it costs. But honestly, Holly needs somebody like that in his life. He needs someone to show him what it looks like to do the right thing in spite of what it costs him. And you can tell also that his character has, at least somewhere down in there, there's a, a real heart. Because you can tell he's mm -hmm. really sympathetic with those children that are in that hospital ward. Yes. He's out to get his man, in this case or his men that have been involved in this plot with Harry because of what they've done. And if they were, if they yes. were smuggling cigarettes or watches or selling uh, tires, he probably would have been a lot less intense in his desire to bring them to justice. I agree. And he's really sad about his partner too. Like you can tell he's like genuinely distraught over the fact that his partner was shot. So yeah, I, I totally agree. I really wish that somebody had picked Alita Valley. I really want to pick her, but I have to call out Ernst Deutsch, the guy who was Baron Kurtz. Kurtz is just so slimy. Even yes. as he's complimenting, I read one of your books. And like, it's just yes. like, <laughs> so he's really good. <laughs> he's so villainous. And he's just, in the things he says, his expressions, the way he bends his eyebrows. This is a good character actor. I haven't even seen him in anything else, but he sticks with me so much. Great, great, great supporting job here from him. Yeah. Hidden Jim. This doesn't have to be a person. It can be a thing. Michael. This little Hansel, the, the little boy who stumbles in <laughs> when Holly is having an argument with the porter and uh, the porter's yelling at him because the porter is really scared that he's going to get somehow mixed up in all, in, in all this uh, situation. And then he ends up being on the street, one that fingers Holly for murdering the porter. Mm -hmm. I just think that you know, his little round face and everything, he's so cherubic looking, but you can tell he's like, <laughs> a, he's probably, uh, <laughs> you know, tying uh, tin cans to cat's tails in the alley. You can tell there's a, there's a mischievousness there that I thought uh, was 
really good. He's he's only in three very brief scenes, but I thought that was just perfect. The little chase scene is adorable. I don't speak his German well enough to know, but I mean, I kind of just picture him going, murderer, murderer, murderer. Right. So <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> he gets he gets a whole mob behind him. That that boy's very compelling. He's a he's a born leader. <laughs> um, Lizzie, hidden gem. So I went with the cat because I have got to say, I think that that was such a brilliant reveal that Harry is alive to have, you know, Holly is at Anna's place and he's trying to woo the cat. And she's like, he doesn't like men. The only person he ever liked really besides me was Harry. When the cat runs off and then lands at, then all you see is the feet. You don't see anything else but the cat rubbing up against it and you're like, oh my gosh, that's Harry. It has to be Harry. And I just, it was such a, a huge fun moment to have that be the reveal that Harry is alive and you don't even have to see his face, you just see his feet and it's still so fun. So I, I think that using such a, an interesting aside as a cat to do that was, was brilliant. Animals are used to signify their important moments. There's a, there's a dog in here, a cat, a yes. cockatoo, a police dog that are used in pivotal scenes. So the cat being the biggest one of them for sure. So my hidden gem is going to be the tunnels that are featured in the Vine Canal. The Vine River runs through central Vienna and out the Danube River. It is 1.6 kilometers. It is an actual huge arced structure. It is amazing. And... Sometimes films transport you in a travelogue sort of way to amazing places. This movie does that, and it is inspiring and real, yes. as you pointed out. So, recast. If you had to recast somebody and put somebody in their place, nobody wants to do it here, I'm pretty sure, because everybody's pretty happy. But to play the game, if you had to replace somebody, who would you replace Michael? You know, you mentioned it earlier. When I thought of the Joseph Cotton character, because of the fact that he plays kind of a someone who's lost his way a little bit. So, well, I, I thought about Jimmy Stewart for that character and I had no idea that he was actually considered. I, I didn't do any research on it, but I think it would have been a different movie if Stewart had been in it. So just from the butterfly effect, I'd be reluctant to recast anybody, but probably the easiest role to recast for me would be major role would be the Joseph Cotton role. That's actually my exact answer with the exact person. I'm just too curious. I'm a Jimmy Stewart fan. I'm just curious to see what it would be like yeah. with him. Is that yours too, Lizzie? No, it's not. I had a really hard time with this, and I really, really loved Alita Valley's character, so this is absolutely no slight to her. I think she did fantastic, but this is just for the sake of the game, but... I would have been really interested to see what Jean Tierney would have done with this role. We watched her in Leave Her to Heaven, and we know that she herself personally was going through so much turmoil as, as a, a woman and, and someone who was struggling to have children and someone that did, and she, she just had a very difficult life as we learned when we watched Leave Her to Heaven. And I think she transferred so much of that grief into her performance, and that's why it was just so fantastic. And so I thought of her in this role because I would imagine she would be able to play that grief-stricken lover just so fantastically. So although I really, really love Valley's performance and I think that she does not need to be replaced, I just think for the sake of the game, she would have it would have been fun to see Jean Tierney make that her own. That's a really good answer. I mean, I also really like Alita Valley a lot. But I think Jean Tierney would be great in this. I think she's a great actress. I'm would like yes. to see more of her stuff. Because we covered Laura, which that's one of my other favorite noir movies. Like that movie is a mind blower in its own right. We did cover it. If you're listening to this and you haven't seen Laura and you like this, that's probably the next place I would point to. A lot of people put that as the best noir movie. When I mean, they make yeah. lists of, you know, this is the 10 best noir movies, a lot of them put that, that one at the top. It's really good. It's right next to this one in the AFI Best Mysteries. So, I mean, if you like this, definitely see Laura and then listen to our episode on it. Shameless plug. <laughs> best shot. Which is, this is going to be hard to do because this movie is a feast of best shots. Michael, is there one that stands out for you? You know, when I was thinking about this, the first thing that I thought of was the scene after Harry is bitten by the parrot and they're chasing him and they go through this huge rubble pile and the, the light in the 
scene is a round circle at the back and there's just enough light on the rubble pile so that you can tell that they're running in rubble and not down a staircase or something like that. I thought that scene was really, really well done and just very unusual. But in the end, I have to borrow from Lizzie here and say that the reveal of Harry with the cat and the way it all unfolded, the fact that just before that, Anna tells Holly that the cat only liked Harry. And then a few seconds later, Holly's walking away and he sees the cat in a doorway and he, he kind of senses that somebody's there. Maybe he sees a shoe, maybe he sees something, but he senses someone's there, starts yelling. And then the light comes on Harry because Holly is yelling and a lady in an upper window opens up the window and the light from the window shows on Harry's face. It's just masterful. Just absolutely masterful. Yes. That sequence is mine, by the way. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's mine because the way the camera pans from the cat through the planter. Yes. Like it goes through the plants very mm -hmm. quickly out into the streets. You have to change lights and focus. This is a hard shot to do. It is a real location shot. And the sequencing of that to build up to the iconic face shot. Oh, he's alive. Yes. It's a high impact moment emotionally as a viewer. It's just done so masterfully with the camera work. So I'm stride for stride with you. And We bragged about Orson Welles acting in this, but the little look that Orson Welles gives Holly yes. when the light finally shows on Harry's face, the little look on his face is like, were you expecting something different? Or I started yeah. to describe that. You didn't see this coming, did you? <laughs> it's his diva moment where he's just like, now they got a movie, oh boy. Oh yeah, there's a twist here. It's so good. Lizzie, how about you? What's your best shot? This was really, really hard, but I just thought it was an impactful scene of the shot and of the city is towards the very end. So they are in the sewers. The big chase has happened and Harry has actually been shot and he's kind of army crawling as best as he can to try to get up the stairs. And I, I'm looking over at Aaron being like, bro, like it's over. Like you're not going to be able to make it up those stairs. But he still tries. He tries as hard as he can. And he sticks his fingers up through the sewer. And the shot of you see that he's about to try to stick his fingers up. And then the shot immediately changes to above ground where you have this, the camera is almost like it's got to be just on the surface of the ground and you have this huge shot of the city the ground is shining and it's absolutely beautiful but there's not a soul out and you just see harry's fingers and it was thrilling and almost borderline creepy and <sighs> just it was such such a great scene and i thought that that still would just raise so many questions to a viewer. I mean, just to be like, have those fingers out in a still with just the post. That would be a great movie poster to just draw you in and make you want to figure out what's going on. Do you know whose fingers those are since Orson Welles wouldn't go down in the sewer? Say, I'm assuming they're not his. Yeah, <laughs> whose are they? Those are Carol Reed's hands, the director. Ah, well, he's a trooper. <laughs> <laughs> I did find it funny that, that uh, some of the ways that he was trying to talk Orson Welles into it there, this like, Look, it's not fecal matter. It's just the, they've been disinfecting the sewers and it just smells a certain way because of how they've been cleaning. It's a chemical smell. It's fine. I'm like, I, I, can, I, I, can, I can see these conversations unfolding. And like Orson Welles just looking at him. He's like, like no. No, 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 old man, no. <laughs> I'm going to go shoot Othello and I'll meet you back in London in another four weeks. See you later, old That's man. That's funny. So, best scene, Michael. The best scene is the ending. I love the what Lizzie just described. I think the, the chase scene in the sewers is phenomenal. I think the scene where Holly comes up on the, the sergeant who's been shot. I, I, there's so many great little moments, but the ending of the movie is the thing that just, I found it so powerful and so different. I bet 99.9% of other directors who made that movie would have had her at least look at Holly as she walked by. I know. And she didn't even look at him. And it's so powerful. I love that scene. That zither playing you off too. Yeah. Yes. Because that is not apathy. Because I think looking at you in some kind of disgust look, I think that that would almost kind of describe more apathy of like, I don't even I don't even care about you. 
you don't even exist to me. It's fine. But to me, to not even acknowledge his existence, because when you are walking down the street and you see a stranger, you're probably going to make eye contact with them, even if you don't care about how their day is going. You're going to just have that moment of human interaction. So to me, to not even look at them is you are so utterly disgusted by this person that you can't even force yourself to look at their direction. Like that is just icy. Is this your best scene as well then, Lizzie? No, my best scene is the what unfolds after the cat. I feel like that twist is like M. Night Shyamalan wishes. Like it's just like (laughs) such a great twist where I, because I did not see that coming. Like we're, Aaron and I are playing guesses of who the third man is throughout the film. And so then to realize that Harry is himself is the third man, I really did not see that coming. And the beautiful shot of them running around the corner, Harry's running around the corner and you just see his shadow run across. To me, that I feel like I've seen that done so many times. And I, to know that that's a pull from this movie is was really, really fun. But to me, that scene was amazing because that's just when everything changed in the movie for me. And mine has to be the sewer chase scene. It's so exciting. It is a great climax of this movie. The tunnels, the lighting, the camera work, it's all coming together right here in the sewers. And it's a great crescendo to this movie. So, Best wardrobe or makeup moment, Michael. The incredibly ill-fitting coat that Anna is wearing in that final scene. And she wears it in a couple other scenes in the movie too. But, you know, here's a beautiful woman who, because of the setting that she's in in Vienna, there's no money. The only money that's being made seems to be made by people who are in the black market. And she has a very nice apartment. Harry has a fabulous apartment, by the way. But her, her apartment's mm-hmm. also very nice. But her clothes are very, very plain. And that coat looks like it could three people could fit inside that coat. It's so ill-fitting and it's so plain looking. And when she's walking down the street in that coat, it's just striking to me that, uh, you know, they could have put her in more glamorous clothes, but it wouldn't have fit with the, the rest of the scene of Vienna. Yes. And Lizzie, how about you? Best wardrobe or makeup moment? I went with something similar. I actually went with all of the trench coats. I noticed that almost every single character at some point is wearing some kind of trench coat with the exception of Major Calloway because he's wearing kind of more of that military coat with like the fur collar. But everybody is wearing a trench coat. And I'm noticing that because trench coats are like all of the Gen Z kids are wearing trench coats now. So my millennial self who's trying to still stay young is thinking that I need to go get myself a trench coat. And so this movie, I was out there noticing like that's on trend, that's on trend, that's on trend. So lots, lots of trending trench coats. I'm going to pick out a specific trench coat and hat. For me, the black hat and black trench coat that Harry Lyme wears is visibly nicer than everybody else's stuff. Yes. He's enjoying his money and it shows in his wardrobe and it's pure black and stark. So it shows up really starkly on the film. It frames his face really well with that hat when he tilts it forward. A lot of character put into that. Harry Lime's only on screen for five minutes, but his wardrobe helps make that a big pop. Change one thing. If you had to change something, Michael. I'm concerned with the butterfly effect here. If I change one thing, it's going to affect (laughs) everything else. But the one thing in the, the movie that I paid more attention to the last time I watched it than I had paid before is when... Anna gets a call and she's speaking in German and she says that whoever was on the other line didn't answer. I wonder what would have happened if she gave you some sort of a hint at that point that it was Harry on the other line, because I think that's probably who it was. And maybe he did speak to her. Hmm. But at, at that point, I still think in my heart that she thinks that he was murdered and that he's dead. But Mm -hmm. what would have happened if he had said something that made her suspicious that it was Harry's voice on the other end? Maybe she wasn't sure, but it sounded like it could have been Harry. I like that. Lizzie, change one thing. This is really hard. And I might have, this might have actually happened and I just missed it. But I want to know who killed Porter and why. You know, I wanted to know, you know, clearly when the scene is with him and He turns around, he looks that person right in the eyes and he knows like his numbers up. You know, you can see the fear in his eyes that he knows what's about to happen. 
But I would have liked to have known why that person decided to do what they did and just kind of how that went down that way. I would have liked to have had a little bit of justice for the porter. Can I give you some speculation on that? Yeah. So uh, shortly before that, Holly tells either Kurtz or Popescu, I think it's Popescu, that the porter told him that there was a third man. Yes. And so I had always assumed that Kurtz and Popescu and maybe Dr. Winkle, Winkle, yes, killed the porter or had him killed because they were concerned that the porter was somehow going to help identify that there was a third man who helped Harry across the street. No, that totally makes sense. I think that you're right, definitely. And then they talk about how that they're arrested later and how they've been caught. So perhaps they are arrested for all the things with Joseph and the things with the porter as well. Mm-hmm. So no, I think you're right. Poor Porter. His poor wife, too. She knew. She didn't want him to get involved. That's right. My change one thing is going to be when Holly exits the Ferris wheel, I want him to look around at the faces of the people in a couple of shots as he's morally contemplating the weight of what he's just found out, the dots, so that Holly sees the faces of the dots as he gets off. Maybe a mom and her child or something and standing in line. So just so that you see the weight of that, of just like, those dots are people. Yeah, that would, that would have been a good idea. That's a good way. one. When I first wrote it down, part of me wants to see Polly not bomb so hard at the dissertation, but that is <laughs> <laughs> like, like when he's lecturing, it's painful. <laughs> that poor goes, guy that was so excited to get him there too. I mean, he has big, big regrets. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> I've come to find that funny now, so I want to keep that. I don't want to change that. So I just yeah. want, to, I want I want I want a more I want to add to that moral dilemma a little bit. So best quote, if you had to pick a best quote here, Michael. I hate to do this, but I have two. You alluded to it earlier. Harry and Holly are in the Ferris wheel, and Harry says, In Italy for thirty years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, bloodshed. But they also produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. I love that line. Oh, that's good. Thank you for reading that off properly. <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that's the that's that really good. I have another line that actually much shorter and ties with that one as my favorite line. It sounds like something from a vampire movie in the same scene. Holly to Harry, they dug up your coffin. And Harry mm-hmm. says, and found Harbin? Hmm. I love that scene. They dug up your coffin. You think yes. about that for a minute. How many times do you? <laughs> <laughs> the look on his face, that's the only time in the entire sequence, too, because he's so smug. But in that exact moment, you can see that there's a spark of fear yes, in his face. Exactly. And Orson Welles does a really good job of doing that. And then immediately shifts right back into when he's, hmm, he's like, whatever, yeah. it's fine. <laughs> it's really good. What's your best quote, Lizzie? Holly and Anna are in, I believe it's Harry's place, but it could possibly be her place. But they're talking, it's in the scene where she's like, you know, tell me everything you know about Harry. She says, about Harry, he never grew up. The world grew up around him. That's all. That's good. Yeah, good line. <laughs> Mine is when Holly questions Harry and says, have you seen any of your victims? Harry then responds, he says, tell me, would you really feel any pity if any of those dots down there stopped moving forever? I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot that stopped. Would you really, old man, tell me that you'd keep your money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spare? Free of income tax, old man. Free of income tax. The only way you can save money nowadays. Just that was the, good. That was really just, good. Just that, just the income tax, like free, like, you know, I mean, like, just like, just tacking that on there. It's just so well framed. So uh, that's, that's so really... a complete disregard of human life. It's chilling. Yeah. And even Holly's kind of looking at him and be like, no, <laughs> no, this is bad. Please don't yeah, do like- that. <laughs> how does this person exist? Like, how is this actually somebody that's real? All right. We've come full circle. And on a scale of five stars with half star intervals, Michael, what would you give the third man from 1949? I would give it five stars for sure, without a hesitation. I'm a list maker. And if I were listing the 10 or 15 greatest movies 
or my inner 15 favorite movies, this would be on the list. I just think it's just about perfect in every way. All right. I love it. Lizzie, how about you on a five-star scale? What's it going to be? It's a five for me too. There's really nothing. I mean, I, I did the change one thing as an exercise and the recast, but in reality, there's nobody I would recast. There's nothing that I would change. And for me, I rate on rewatchability. My dad knows that I will rewatch a movie that I like over and over and over again. This is something I will rewatch and I will recommend. And I actually look forward to getting to watch it again with, with a different set of eyes. And I just, I think this movie is superb. I've been gushing about it as well. I love this movie and I will show my cards here and just say, the prospect of this possibly getting to be a show. <laughs> the first person who mentioned it indirectly, I said, we've got to get this. We, we need to make this happen because I want to do this. And I love this movie and my appreciation has only grown. And I've really enjoyed doing the homework and sharing it with you guys. And I love that you got to see it for your first time, Lizzie. So it's been a fun experience and a fun episode for me. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you so much, Michael. You're very welcome. Lizzie, do you want to help me pick a movie for next time? I do. I do. So this movie had a broken down Vienna post-war. So we're going to completely switch gears, take it in a totally different direction next week. And it's going to be all about love and laughter. Are you ready? I am. I'm ready to laugh. All right. Option number one is bringing up baby from 1938. While trying to secure a $1 million donation for his museum, a befuddled paleontologist is pursued by a flightly and often irritating heiress and her pet leopard baby. Option number two, Mr. Deeds goes to town from 1936. An unassuming greeting card poet from a small town in Vermont heads to New York City upon inheriting a massive fortune and is immediately hounded by those who wish to take advantage of him. Option number three, it happened one night from 1934. A renegade reporter trailing a young railway heiress for a big story joins her on a bus heading from Florida to New York, and they end up stuck with each other when the bus leaves them behind at one of the stops. You know, these are all good movies, I'm sure. I'm going to do the one that I haven't seen yet, and the one that I know is very lauded, and I'm just curious to find out more about it, the oldest one on your list. It happened one night. Yes, that's a good choice. You know, I had no idea that Mr. Deeds from Adam Sandler was a remake of Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Yes, there so are one no of Steve Buscemi. There are no Steve Buscemi crazy eyes in it, but yes. That's that. right. That's right. But It Happened One Night is certainly a better choice. All right. Again, Michael, thank you so much. Oh, you're very, 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 very welcome. Yes. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie. And thank you, all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us because we want to hear from you. So subscribe, rate, and review to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Pandora, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe on our YouTube channel. Give us a like on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and at Twitter at, at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. And producing and providing this podcast is fun, but not free. So we invite you to support our show at our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash retromovieroundtable. All contributions are much appreciated and will go towards making the show better for you, the listeners. Free of income tax, too, by the way, those donations. Free of income tax. <laughs> As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Lizzie? I'm not bad. I was just drawn that way. I had fun. Thank you. I, this was really fun. Uh, Lizzie's heard this before, but do you have time for a quick story about post-war Vienna? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. A very good friend of mine, his father told me the story in person. So I, I heard it directly from the source. He was in the American zone in Vienna and they uh, got permission to go hunting into the French zone, I guess it was. And he met a girl there. He was telling this in front of his wife. So I don't know if there was a romantic interlude b between him and the woman or not, but they struck up a relationship anyway, and he would go into the zone and meet her and he would take things to her. And she said, can you get a message to my father? He's in New York. I can't get out of the country and I can't leave to, to go to see him, but he, uh, and I can't get a message to him. So this guy l takes letters and smuggles them back into the American zone and mails them to New York. 
when his time is up and he's getting ready to go back to New York, she said, when you go to New York, you have to go see my father. And because he's going to want to know who was the intermediary for all these letters. So he goes to see the guy in New York and the guy gives him a check for $10,000. Wow. And he took the money and invested it. And it became the biggest liquor, beer and wine distributorship in West Virginia. That's my home state. That's where I'm from. <laughs> the guy sent three of his three of his kids to Oxford. He made a fortune out of this, but that's how he got his money. And I, I told you the short version of the story, but things like that actually happened in Vienna. Really it was a cool. crazy mixed up time. Tremendous. Wow. I'm glad you told me that. That's just really interesting. So thank you so much. Well, thank uh, you, you were... Russell. I, I appreciate it. I enjoyed it. Lizzie, thanks for the opportunity. Yes. Uh, I hope it worked out okay. Newton, it was awesome. This was really, really fun. Love you, Dad. Bye. Love you too.